afternoon. My name is Paul Farmer. I'm the Chief Executive of MIND and it's a very warm welcome to all of you to our fourth Taking Care of Business webinar. Help, it's designed to provide help and support for people in work uh, to support people with mental health problems to work. Um, today our focus is on uh, human resources professionals and uh, we know that many human resources professionals are joining us uh, through this webinar and you're most welcome but even if you're not a HR professional you might be a line manager or somebody with direct experience. I very much hope that this conversation will be of uh, interest to you. Um, this, this piece of work is very much a part of the work that we do at MIND to promote the supports that people with mental health problems need to work effectively um, inside a whole variety of different workplaces and is part of a major campaign that we've been running for the last couple of years. I think what's one of the things that's been really interesting about this campaign is over those last couple of years we've begun to see the issue of mental health really coming to the fore both in, in public um, and also inside businesses and work that we did uh, last year um, uh, gave us a very good reason why that, why that is the case. So we now know that one in six workers is dealing with anxiety, depression or stress, um, that work is the most stressful factor for many people um, and yet at the same time we have also heard time and time again that people uh, feel that it's difficult to speak up and be open about their mental health because of the stigma that surrounds the issue. One of the other things that's been happening over these last couple of years is a growing sense that the business case for tackling mental health in the workplace is becoming increasingly clear. Uh, so it's not just the £26 billion cost to the economy, but it's also this sense that if you do invest in mental health um, in the workplace, you can improve productivity and you can improve the, the sense of well-being of your staff um, as a whole. Um, so we've certainly seen over this time uh, a recognition that open and supportive workplaces really can make a difference to the whole workforce and in turn supporting people with, uh, who may experience mental health problems. And I think these are some of the themes that we're likely to explore in the course of the next 45 minutes or so um, in, the, in the duration of this, this webinar. Um, and particularly for those of you who do work as HR professionals, um, this issue of mental health won't be, probably won't be a new one to you. However, it certainly seems to me that in the last couple of years, there's been an increased emphasis on HR professionals to play a, a larger role in terms of addressing and supporting both individuals in the workforce, but also managers uh, to be able to, to, to get it right. So today uh, we have a panel of experts here. Um, to my right, uh, Ben Wilmot um, is the lead of the CIPD's public policy team. The CIPD will be very well known to you um, as an organisation that has over 130,000 members, the vast majority of whom work in, in HR. Next to uh, Ben, Emma Mamo from Mind is, is our lead on the Taking Care of Business campaign um, and is our go-to person for anything uh, around this whole issue. And to my left, uh, Julian Hill uh, runs his own business, uh, Care HR Limited, which particularly provides uh, support to people, to organisations in the health and social care environment. Um, and we'll certainly be looking at that sector um, in a moment. So the format today is very much up to you. We're taking your questions uh, and we're going to do our very best to answer as many of them as possible. Um, we've already got some questions um, coming in, but please do start to send your questions in so that we can get through as many of them um, as we can. Um, and we'll kick off uh, immediately with a, with a bit of a sense, I guess, about how uh, for HR, whether HR professionals in different sectors, whether this issue matters too much. Ben, you have a huge membership. Does, does it matter which sector you're working in? Does it matter if you're in the public, the private or the voluntary sector in terms of how you address mental health in the workplace? I, mean, I think there are some core principles that apply across all sectors and um, I quite like um, the um, employee engagement enablers which um, uh, David McLeod identified um, f through his re review of employee engagement for, for the government um, and that's as, as a sort of a framework for, um, for, for building um, you know, positive healthy work cultures and so the, 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 the first element is around sort of clarity over, over purpose, so people mm -hmm. understand and buy into the, the organisation's strategic objectives. Um, the second is around integrity, so making sure that um, how people behave actually reflect the organisation's stated values, that they're not just a, a passing reference on the internet or in the annual report. 
Um, the third element is around employee voice, so people feel that they, they have a voice, mm. that, they, that their views matter. And the, the, the final element mm. is around engaging managers, and um, McLeod um, calls this managers who have the ability to engage people's hearts and minds. Um, and I think that last bit is, is absolutely critical. So it is your line managers who will be uh, developing the, the sort of core relationship and picking up on, on early warning signs which might show that people are struggling. But crucially also, <laughs> management style um, will decide whether or not people are um, under uh, the right amount of pressure, um, whether they, they, f they feel that, they're going the you know, that they want to go the extra mile, whether they're stressed, etc. So I think how you train your managers, what learning interventions you, you put in place that actually achieve behaviour change. I think that's crucial. And, but of course you do need the right support because the right support, no matter how well people are managed, that people will fall through the gaps and people mm. will suffer from mental health problems. So you do need early access to occupational health services. So that means, and I, and I, I, I do think that it, that needs to be sometimes, you know, day one for, for issues like, you know, stress and other common mm. and, and um, um, uh, mod, um, more common mental health problems. So I think those are the sorts of um, fundamentals that, that all organisations need in place, mm -hmm. um, ideally to, to, to hopefully um, support uh, mental health in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And Julian, um, uh, health people who work in health and social care sectors are often facing very kind of stressful situations. Are there particular issues that uh, HR staff and uh, line, line managers need to, be, need to be aware of, or, or do, do Ben's principles apply in the same way? I think fundamentally Ben's principles apply to any workplace, but what I would say is there are clear challenges in the health and social care sector at the moment. Obviously people as a baseline are often dealing with death and distress on an everyday mm. uh, occasion. Um, there are very key pressures, both health and social care systems are being very pressured financially. That's causing HR colleagues to be involved in many more cases of service redesign and redundancy than possibly ever before. There are the challenges post Francis. Are people able to speak up? What is the role of a whistleblower and how do HR people support people who need to whistleblow? And I think interestingly within the NHS, as far as I'm aware, it was the first job evaluation scheme that tried to measure stress by including an emotional effort factor in the job evaluation scheme. Mm. And Emma, does that, do, do you think that, that does work, that, that there does need to be a particular attention to to organisations which may have uh, particular different factors? Or yeah, I mean, I think in any workplace there'll be pressures, there'll be the nature of the business which have an impact on people's mental health, so you need to have a kind of mature conversation about what those are and then how you can manage it effectively. And I think even within workplaces you can have different teams, different cultures, so we've worked with National Grid and they have staff in the offices, but they also have field engineers, so having a conversation with the office staff mm -hmm. and about their mm -hmm. needs is quite different to the needs of field engineers. And I know that they, when talking with the uh, people out um, down manholes and so on, they were talking about, well, we already think about health and safety quite a lot. What keeps us safe is good sleep. What might impact on us having good sleep might be mental distress. So then they kind of linked it in with those conversations that are already happening. So sometimes it's the language. It might be the language of health and safety in one place, but it might be the language of care and support in another yeah. it might, might be the, the, the It can the be individual, but I think, yeah, you know, the, the principles that Ben outlined, yeah. I think, are applicable to all. Yeah, great. Okay, so um, let's, let's go into the, 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 the questions uh, fr from, from you, the audience. Please do, do keep them coming in. And let's start with the, uh, a, a question from Jenny, uh, one we hear quite often, uh, about a, a, her company, which is good at supporting uh, staff with an EAP and good occupational health. But as an HR practitioner, she says they don't. We don't hear or often hear about issues until they're too far down the line. Um, how can we encourage line managers and staff to come to us sooner? So how do we create? I guess how do you create that environment where early intervention and early support is best? Emma, um, I think it's really important to embed talking about people's mental health in how you manage people. Um, you know, and just get it normalised. So within my team, we have monthly catch-ups. 
and I'll go through a set agenda with the people that I manage and we'll talk about what's gone on over the last month, you know, what have they been working on, what have they found challenging, what's gone well and why. And then you can start having conversations and you also talk about, well, how is your mental health and how has some of your work or um, had an impact on that? Conversely, how has your mental health been and how might that have impacted on your work? So I think it's just normalising these conversations and seeing it as central to good people management and central to achieving you know um, your your business objectives and so on so it's so it's part of everyday conversation so I think that's one way yeah. no I'd absolutely agree with that I mean certainly the research we did with the health and safety executive on online management behavior and and the link to stress showed that um, what one of one area of, of, of behavior is around managing the individual and really understanding what makes the individual tick and, and a lot of that is around you know basic common sense but also as Emma says, setting time aside to ensure that, that managers can have one-to-ones on a regular basis so they can talk about you know, the sorts of issues that might, might cause problems. The other thing is I think, um, I think return to work interviews are really important and, and potentially valuable, but only, mm. if, only if they um, are properly structured and um, the, the manager is act- actually engaging. And the, the Royal Mail has a, a great um, e-learning tool where they, they have a scenario um, on, on, on a, um, a video where a, um, a depot manager um, is doing a return to work interview with, with a postie and on the face of it, you know, he asks all the right questions, uh, there's, there's nothing he's done wrong. Um, then he, he, the same scenario again, um, exactly the same questions except this time the, the manager is engaging, listening, empathising and the whole conversation is completely different. Mm. And, and I think it's those opportunities that managers need to make the most of to build trust so that people will open up. And it's only, only when you do that that you actually are able to create a culture where people feel that they, they, you know, they, they can hold their hand up. And in, in, this, in this kind of context where somebody, where the HR team maybe feel as though they're getting involved too, too late, if you like, in, as, as Jenny's put it, what 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 is the role of HR in terms of that early involvement? Is it predominantly about supporting the managers, or is it is is there also a, a kind of a, a role in terms of being able to see from a distance that there may be some problem emerging? Um, I think there's a bit of both. So, I mean, it, you know, it's useful to have the data as well. So obviously, you know, you, if you've got absence data which yeah. shows that you've got pockets of of um, you know frequent absences in a particular tar- a department. Obviously, or you know, areas of where you've got you know significant um, cases of long-term uh, mental health, mm. you know, th- that sort of data is really important as well. Staff attitude survey data, you know, that that can give you some of the big picture stuff. But um, developing managers is so crucial. Mm. So how HR mm. works with L and D, depending on the size of the organisation, um, is is absolutely critical because it is ultimately line management capability that will make it the real difference. Mm. Julian, you must have seen a lot of these kinds of examples where the HR department find themselves in a very uh, difficult position. Yeah, I mean, for me, the fundamental here is developing relationships. It's relationships with managers, but it's actually getting to know the teams of those managers that you're supporting. I think in terms of uh, a practical early intervention is get your managers to ask a very open question. So, how stressed are you? Direct to that member of staff. We have to acknowledge that stress is part of everybody's Mm. work. So really then, it's how stressed are you? A manager I know does a really good thing where they actually draw somebody swimming and actually get the member of staff to draw a line of where the sea is, i.e. how drowning maybe are you? Just as a very real, you know, example of how somebody can make a very easy uh, difference to those questions. Um, I think the fundamental thing as well is its relationships and then it's actually acting on those. So um, two key things I would always say is you need to make a difference. So when you're aware that stress or mental health issues are arising, name it and then deal with it. It's really important not to just left, leave things bubbling away, but name it and deal with it. Mm. So let's, let's move from the idea of uh, uh, providing help and support early into um, into the, the kind of kit that line managers need. So Dan says, um, if we could give managers a few simple rules, messages for supporting staff, what would they be, Emma? 
Oh, um, I really like this idea around supported empowerment. So we know that um, a too distant manager isn't helpful. We know a micromanager isn't helpful. And I know myself, there's different tasks I do within the workplace, which sometimes wouldn't bother me. Other times they might phase me because an element is slightly different. And how would my manager know what the best way that my manager deals with me is Shalar saying, how, how involved do you want me to be? Do you want to work some ideas up and come back to me? Or do you want to run with it? And she also makes me feel that even if I say to, my, say to her, I actually want to run with it, but then if I feel, or I'm not really sure about what uh, approach to take, I can then go back to her. So I think it's, yeah, and supported empowerment and this kind of you know, flexible support, and the only way to get it right is to ask people. So mm. that's one thing I would say. Mm. Um, I mean, I, quite similar to Emma, I think. I, I think um, we, we know that um, coaching is, mm. uh, a, you know, crucial um, for line managers if they are going to get the, the best out of their staff, and um, it is, is part of an ongoing conversation around sort of performance. Um, but it's very much a two-way conversation um, which recognises that you know actually people's well-being impacts on their performance and so you know you have you have to take that into account and um, so I, I think it's just reinforcing to, to line managers that um, it's in their interests um, to have these conversations to invest time in their staff mm. um, because ultimately that is about how you manage a high-performing high performing team so I think it's crucial to get across to managers that this isn't they're, they're not just doing it because HR want them to do it. They're doing it to help them help them become better managers. And I, I think quite often you get ma line managers who say, "Well, I haven't got time, for, you know, to, for yeah. to hold a one-to-one, -one, you know, um, every two weeks." And <coughs> the problem is you get this sort of vicious circle of poor manage management. So managers are not investing time in their staff. So they are de having to deal with absence, um, formal disciplinaries and uh, um, grievances, um, and and. So you, you end up this, then having less time to invest upfront in the, in the positive conversations that will, will mean you don't hopefully end up with these sorts of problems in the first place. So I think if you, if, if you can educate managers so that they start to see why it's so important, then mm. that's when you get by. So is, is, that's almost the eternal dilemma for an HR professional, isn't it? How do you spend less of your time doing the crisis management and more of your time investing in in staff, so how, how, how would you encourage HR professionals to give these messages to, to line managers? I think, and, and it's part of the learning I think from Francis around the NHS, is mm. that you, to avoid crises and to avoid disciplinaries, you have to invest up front. So very much the messages for managers are be open, make time for those regular one-to-ones. They're unbelievably important in making somebody feel safe and supported at work talk about mental health, so have it as an issue. Maybe bring it up at team meetings, for example. Uh, and finally, you know, get them to think, are they challenging stigma to prevent some of these crises developing so people can speak freely about how they're feeling? So if they hear uh, stigmatising words, I mean, how often do you wander around a workplace and hear bonkers or mad or, you know? So get managers to challenge those words. When they're in use, get them to challenge. Is stigma a problem in this? So, in this space, Emma? Um, well, I mean, I've, I've been working at Mind for seven years and, you know, mental health attitudes have been improving in the wider world. I think within the workplace, because most workplaces have an element of pressure. When does pressure become stress? When does stress become something more serious? I think with the economic climate, if you put your hand up and say you can't, you know, you're, you're, you're struggling, are you putting yourself in line mm. for the chopping block? So, yeah, I think stigma can be a real concern for people. And if mental health isn't spoken about in your workplace, why on earth would you put your hand up first? So um, it is a concern. Obviously, we know from people coming to our webinars, we know employers mm. coming to work with us, they want to get this right. So mm. hopefully okay. it's improving. Well, that, that, that takes us, just refer referencing the uh, recession, takes us into a question from Molly about um, the, the current economic climate and people's fear about losing their jobs and uh, and the question from her is how can HR support managers to support in turn support their teams during what can be uncertain times Ben you must uh, hear about this a lot um, in the last couple of years so yeah t t tough environment yeah absolutely lots of uncertainty um, it's not not necessarily the not so necessarily great for people's mental health but how do HR support managers and indeed um, how do HR get the right support themselves? Yeah, 
Well, it, I mean, I, it's interesting actually because if, if you um, our absence management survey of, uh, over the last few years has, has very much shown that um, when the labour market is under uh, if by, by you know, most stress, I unemployment is going is going up, mm. then um, absence levels go down because okay. people are more concerned about about their jobs. And and our our survey did report higher higher levels of re reported presenteeism during yes. those times. So there is absolutely a link between people's um, concerns about job security and how they behave and and how they might um, decide not to say I've got a problem. I think so. It, it is definitely an issue. It's definitely an issue. I think for for, for HR, it's it's recognising that and making sure that that people know that there is support available um, and that um, you know again you know that. Managers have those regular conversations, but also if you have a, an employee assistance program that people are signposted to it, reminded that it's, that it's there for a purpose. Um, and um, and I, but I think the the other thing is also around you know good leadership management. So that's the time mm -hmm. when your chief exec and your executive team need to be visible, visible, um, reassuring staff, or being completely um, open about about what is. The state of the, the 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 business environment, how that is affecting the organisation. Because I think when there's no news, that's when people worry most. Mm -hmm. So people and the rumor mill. exactly. So it's it's better that people know what the re what the reality of the situation is than being left in a vacuum. So I think you know communication and meaningful consultation is crucial um, when you are in that sort of environment. And we've certainly seen some examples of very creative routes, haven't we? More uh, flexible working, more part-time working. Especially so in the manufacturing industry, they've really learned from previous times. Yes, I'd agree with that. Another architect firm, architecture firm who got in contact with us around the campaign, they um, have very quite generous staff benefits because they feel if we invest in our staff, they'll work harder or their clients have always said it's a joy to work with your team. When they started struggling, um, they involved their staff in saying we need to make cuts in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And they involved staff in it and everyone said, right, cut there, do that. And I think you can kind of weather the storm together. And, and I would totally agree with what Ben says, you know, no news is, um, um, can often start people um, concerned. And then actually I think it's just about having effective communication and make it two way rather than just talking at people. And uh, I mean, the, the Ben mentioned this question of presenteeism. Um, that that's not great if you're working in a uh, health sector or in, in the NHS where your skills are, you know, makes getting it wrong can have very dramatic consequences. Absolutely, and infection control needs to to take priority. Really, caring for the patients in that situation yeah. would have to take priority over somebody's need to be present. But we do know that it happens. For me, I, I come back to, to the first point really, which is it's all about transparency. Mm. Involve trade unions, for example, if you need to start having conversations. If you don't have a trade union, then I would hope you'd have staff forums in medium size or larger size employers. So start to have those conversations as you need to. I think really uh, key then is just to be open with people. The risk are if you aren't, is that the gossip will start, rumbling, will go on, uh, people will start to get demotivated and of course the most talented people, some of the people you might want to, to hang on to are actually probably the most employable and therefore the people you're most likely to lose. So by not being open, honest, transparent and sharing all that information there can be some real negative uh, things happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So um, we've talked about uh, helping people get, get, get people help, help early. Um, and, and also the support that managers and indeed senior leaders um, uh, can play, and we'll come back to that um, in a moment. But we also know that people um, experience mental health problems uh, and do have time off, um, off, and indeed it's now, the, I think according to Ben's data, the biggest cause of sickness absence um, uh, in this country. So um, how do you support somebody, um, asked Jinder, uh, to, who is returning to work after an absence, um, to, to get that right kind of that, that right kind of return to work process right? How do, you, how do you get that right? Okay, I think the first key is minimise the absence really. And I mean, you know, if somebody has to be off sick, then they have to be off sick, but you can keep in touch. So maintain communications throughout that period of sickness. So you'll understand how they're feeling, what's going on for them. You'll understand what their GP or consultants are saying. 
And then I think it's about looking at the broad range. So maybe in larger firms where there are occupational health departments, obviously there's a clear role for occupational health supporting that return to work. And I'd recommend that. Obviously there's room for, for counselling services as well, and again a lot of employers have those. And then it's about having a return to work mean, meeting that's meaningful. Mm. So it has to be honest and open and people have to be heard and you need to understand what are their stresses. So are there particular roles or particular tasks maybe that are better avoided in the early stages? What are the maximum number of hours that a person should work mm. each day? So do you need to offer them reduced hours, a phased return to work? That's a number of uh, mm. ideas. Mm. Great, thanks. Emma, any um, examples that we've heard? Well, no, I was just going to say, and I also think it's just too good to have a talk about the first day. Do they want to get met mm -hmm. at the door? Who do they want to have lunch with? And then, you know, saying if you're going to put support measures in place, have a discussion, agree a time when you're going to review if they're working. So I think it's, you know, really um, thinking about those issues and then also thinking about the wider team, speaking to the individual and asking what they want communicated to the rest of the team. Because I know from a lot of research studies, people's return to work is often quite dependent on the support they get from mm. team members. And I think that's quite an important conversation to have with the individual in terms of, um, yeah, that wider communication. Mm. Yeah, that last point came across very strongly um, with research we did with the British Occupational Health Research Foundation, again looking at the role of a line manager in supporting successful and lasting returns to work. Um, the other thing is I, I do think um, you, know, you need someone who is going to essentially act as a case manager for, mm. for that individual's rehabilitation. And in my view, again, I'm sorry, it should be the, the, uh, the, the line manager in conjunction with, with HR if, if you have mm. HR, depending on the side of the organisation. but. It is um, the, the person who is regularly touching base, seeing, checking on progress. Um, you know, there will be occasions when people relapse, and you know. So, how do you get over those bumps in the road? And and I think managers need to understand that actually, in in those circumstances, people can um, they need a little bit more um, uh, management, probably. I, you know, you probably need to be a bit clearer about some of your communications. People can misconstrue emails. Um, for example, um, if they're feeling vulnerable, um, so you know more, a more it probably means more face to face um, and um, a bit more investment until that in time until that person has um, has has got up to speed and is feeling more resilient. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Please do keep those questions coming in. We've got um, probably 15, 20 minutes before we finish, so uh, please do feed the questions into us. We've got. Uh, Plenty of time to uh, to do that, and we've got a question um, now from Hillary, who asks us about supporting um, employees that maybe don't want to engage. So, uh, how do you support somebody who um, isn't uh, is perhaps just doesn't believe they have an issue, or um, or indeed uh, just doesn't want to engage on on this okay. story? So, you know, interesting. What's the role of the union, perhaps, in these kinds of scenarios? Okay, I'm ju I just want to differentiate between an employee who's not engaged versus somebody who might have mental health issues yeah. and is not necessarily yeah, aware good. of that. It, it, I, I think let's, let's assume the latter. The latter. Um, gosh, okay. I, I think the key thing really then is starting to have those communications with that member of staff. So. What is it that you're worried about? What is it that you're eliciting that makes you concerned about this individual? So what is it? Is it mood? Are they looking stressed? Are they always coming in late? Are their cigarette breaks getting longer and longer and longer? Um, you know, are they, are they mentioning something unusual that doesn't quite make sense mm. to you? Um, and then I think I go back to my early comment really, it's then about name it. So I've noticed you look like, it feels to me that you're looking really sad at the moment and just having those open conversations. And don't just necessarily accept, yeah, I'm fine. Mm. Actually do something about it, talk further. So are they seeing GP? Are they aware of the employee assistance program? Have you got a counselling service? Um, but also, you know, you also need to take care of that employee in a business. You owe both the duty of care. So at some point you might need to make a decision about intervening and just saying, I'm really sorry, you need to go home. 
-hmm. And obviously doing that in a very supportive way and sharing EAP numbers, sorry, employee assistance program numbers, or the Samaritans phone numbers, mine's phone mm -hmm. number, I should mm -hmm. say. Uh, you know, um, just to have the conversation, name your concerns and then begin to deal with it. But if you do send somebody home, then again, minimise that absence and the impact of that. So keep in touch with them. Mm. Emma? Um, I'd agree. I'd also say that potentially if you've um, seen a change in someone and you want to broach that conversation, trying to think about the best environment to approach it to, based on what you know of the person. But I think even if you bring that conversation up, it might not be the right time for that person to mm. open up. So I think it's just trying to show that you're on their side, you're there to support them, and that your door is open. Mm. So I think, you know, just trying to communicate that. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, th I think um, you know, sometimes you, you have people who are sort of suffering from uh, boiling frog syndrome that, you know, they, they, they haven't realised that... that they need to the, jump the, out. That, that, yeah, that stress, you know, stress is, is, you know, can be you know, cumulative. And, um, and I think sometimes you don't even recognise yourself that, that it's got to a point that it's impacting on, you know, your behaviour, mm. your emotional response, mm. your performance. Um, it, you know, it might be you're not taking holidays or, or lunch breaks. And as a, as a manager, you need to be able to say, look, you know, just use these as examples and say, you know, that's, you know I'm worried about you because of X. Yeah. Or, you know, you, if someone's performance is declining, say, well, you know, ex ex say, look, examples of what, you know, is there any, then is there anything else, you know, what's underlying this? Try and, try and to get them to open up to you about what the problem is. Um, and I, I think it is so trying to find um, the... The, the way to broach conversation that will resonate with the individual you're, you're dealing yeah. with. Um, and, but including potentially, uh, you know, as, as Julian suggested, kind of uh, encourage, strongly encouraging somebody to walk out of the door and take some time absolutely. out. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, that could well, you know, I mean, that could well be what, what that person needs, you know. So mm. um, time out. I think it's, you know, it's horses for courses, you know, yeah. um, and, and recognising that. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I just had a, an additional yeah. thought. Just recommend to HR professionals out there, go and Google Zubin's Stress Vulnerability Model. It's a really nice way of understanding what tips some people between mental health and ill health. I'd find it difficult to explain it in the next 10 minutes and without a nice <laughs> illustration behind me, but Stress Vulnerability Model is a really interesting way of understanding how that might happen. And it's that, it's that, it's that link, isn't it, between the stress that helps us to perform very well and thrive in terms of what we do and the kind of stress, the kind of bad stress in inverted commas that, that actually is, is poor, is, influences our performance negatively and yeah. is detrimental. It explains why a dead cat, for example, might just be enough to tip somebody over the edge or not being included in a coffee round, for example. It just yeah. shows how things add up and at different times with different circumstances, different people, just a very minor thing and tip somebody over the edge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is, is you know, having a, a clear understanding and language about what is stress, what does it mean for your business? I, mm. I quite like the health and safety executive's uh, definition, which is um, the adverse reaction that people have, have to um, excessive pressure or other yeah. types of demand placed upon them. So, um, you know, if, so that people do start uh, to have a, a sort of consistency in terms of how, how they talk about the issue. Mm. Okay. So um, uh, it's still time for more questions from you, and we have one from Sejal, which uh, kind of talks about, uh, we've talked about different cultures in different sectors, but quite often organisations have different cultures inside their own, uh, their own, organi inside their own organisation. Um, and Sejal is saying in, su in, in, in their firm, some, some teams have an open culture and focus on well-being, others are resistant. So um, how do you promote well-being for the whole workforce? And, Ben, this comes back to, to, to the point you were making earlier about the role of senior management and, and leadership inside organisations. Uh, so how, how, do you, how do you get that right, do you think? Um, well, I think it, it does come down to, I mean, I think it's a combination of, you know, values, um, but also um, understanding, you know, what is the, the, the business case for in, investing in a, you know, a healthy and re resilient mm. organisational culture. Um, so, you know, if you are... A, a manager who thinks you're going to get results by driving performance, by, by you know not taking um, you know excuses as you see them for poor performance, um, you know you might you might get some short-term wins. But we also know that um, you know stress impairs people's cognitive abilities. We know there's a link between 
stress and higher risk of accidents, for example. Mm. So mm. we know there's a link between stress and, and um, you know, customer satisfaction. So, you know, I think it's, um, it's talking to managers in terms of what will drive sustainable performance for, for the business. Um, and, and I think there's quite a lot of evidence around, you know, the, the different elements of the business case which can support those conversations so you can explain why, uh, besides, of course, you know, meeting your, your duty of care, as an employer, um, and you know, and meeting your legal obligations, but there's a there's a bigger picture around, you know, um, Im- improving how you perform long term as an organisation. Mm. Mm. And and uh, wh- wh- what's the role of the HR manager or the head of HR if if they exist in in that? Are they the are they the culture changers or are, the pe- are they the people who need to provide the business case to the senior managers? What what what's their job? Yeah. Do you think? Well, I mean, c- certainly, I think you know. The, Having the evidence, having the data is crucial. Um, right. So I think you know, data from um, employee attitude surveys, from yeah. exit interviews, from um, you know the staff forum, um, you know, wherever you can get information. And, and I suppose you know, in more um, in, in organisations, you know, that are able to, to you know have more experience around using data. Um, Make, make, tr- making the, the correlation between employee engagement and, and customer satisfaction. So, for example, Nationwide has done that quite successfully. So, you know, if you if you have that evidence, then you can then you can go to the board and say, actually, this is why we need to invest in improving the leadership and management skills um, of our of our management population because you know we know it links to employee engagement. We know that links to in, enhance mm. customer satisfaction and sales. So, I, th- I think that's that's certainly part of it. The other bit is is around how HR um, works with um, in terms of organisational development. So you know if you are looking to change change culture, then um, you know HR needs to be at the heart of that process to make yeah. sure the, the the people management elements of, of any change process are absolutely embedded. Yeah. And Emma, work, work being well being for the workforce is um, it's a bit more than just um, kind of fresh fruit bowls and um, bean bags. Uh, to, to relax in, isn't it? I mean, mm-hmm. it, what, what does what does that look like? How do you how do you encourage uh, the senior managers to take that seriously? Um, well, we would say that for any organisation to do this well, they need to have a mental health strategy that promotes well-being for all your staff, and that's about good work-life balance. I mean, we know that long hours, client, dr- you know, meeting targets and so on, but sustained long hours are not helpful to people. It's about good working relationships. It's about good communication. Then the second part of it is, yeah, taking stock of the mental health in your work of your workforce regularly, um, being alert to any issues, and then acting upon them, and having that kind of um, a quite good overview. And then thirdly, it's about being able to support staff who are mm. experiencing a problem. So you can't have the support without doing the well-being and the tackling. It, it needs to be comprehensive. Yeah, I'm not uh, for different cultures in different places, I suppose it's understanding some of those, maybe bunkers is one word to describe them, it sometimes feels like people are operating in different bunkers for sure. Uh, I mean one organisation I worked for employed a hugely diverse workforce, um, so they'd employ mental health nurses who were quite gregarious and, and loud at times, uh, and then had a whole librarian team. Okay. And you know, it was appropriate that the different cultures existed mm. and, and, and understand those really. But I suppose um, it's about understanding that and then trying to be person-centred and team-centred mm. and looking at those needs and addressing them. But where you recognise you've got bunkers, whether it's for, for good or ill reasons, is try and open them up. Try and, you know, think about open spaces in your workplace. So where can these different people meet and talk and support each other and start to influence the culture of the organisation? Canteens is obviously another one mm. where you get different people in different rooms um, from sorry from different teams in the same room. So think about that and again talk about it around organisational development, learning and development. Look at it around team building as well and bring where you have maybe a couple of managers in a senior management team that are less uh, open around mental health or more dictatorial. Is get the management team together and get them discussing those issues and their approaches. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. Um, next question from, from Matthew touches on uh, a, a growing issue inside um, organisations, inside workplaces, around the lines between um, work and the rest of your life. And with the arrival of um, mobile phones and smartphones and 
uh, and the ability to work out away from your workplace, those mm. lines are increasingly blurred. So Matthew says um, uh, that, that his colleague is struggling with their workload, but the bigger problem is an issue that they have in their, in their personal life, a relationship issue. What, what, what should we as HR professionals do and managers um, in terms of responding to that? So where are these lines? Yeah. I think there's a report due out next week which is going to touch on this. Well, we, um, <coughs> we just um, had uh, some research out a couple of years ago which, which looked at um, the, the sort of causes of, of poor mental health in the workplace. So we, mm. we asked people, this is a, um, a representative sample of, of 2,000 people in employment, so we asked people to characterise their mental health between very good and, and very poor. Um, those those um, employees who said their health was poor were very poor. We asked some reasons why and, and whether whether that was sort of uh, it was work related or whether it was uh, caused by something out, outside the workplace or whether it was a combination of of sort of work and non work mm. factors. And two thirds said it was a combination right. of work and non work factors. So I don't I think it's very hard to to to. to um, Identify, you know, where um, you know the issue necessarily sort of stops, um, and I think the, the the key is to help people unpick the different causes, um, and and then w once you know the causes, then you can start putting in place a strategy, you know, to, to hopefully reach a reach a solution. So, mm -hmm. and and again, that's you know that's why managers need to have conversations with staff about, you know. They need to know a bit about what happens in their lives outside work. So, mm. um, Tim, I think it's the shoe company Timpsons. They have yeah. um, a interesting approach where they get their managers that essentially have to know something like ten things about their staff's lives outside work as a as a discipline for for managers to understand that it's important that they know the employee in the round. They're, that that enables them to then you know have these conversations where they can they can help people navigate through the different pressures they're under. And then work out what type of flexibility they can offer as an organisation to help mm. that individual, you know, get through that. Mm. Emma, I was just going to um, use a personal example. I lost a family member the other year, and I took some bereavement leave. And when I came back, I was struggling with one part of my job dealing with calls from people. So my manager just said, well, "What do you want to happen?" And I said, "Well, could someone take my calls for a couple of weeks until I was back up? My own resilience could kind of maintain professional distance to kind of deal with quite." quite emotionally charged, distressing calls from people. So I would say that, you know, whether it's a, a, you know, a short period of mental distress that someone's going through because of a personal, mm -hmm. you know, relationship breakdown or something else, I think it's just looking at, well, how might that impact on your work and what can we do to manage that for a, for a short period? And this isn't really reasonable adjustments, is it? This is just good support sensible measures. management, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? Good support for people. Yeah. 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 For me, I mean, obviously it's key that there are some form of boundaries between mm. employee-employee relationships yeah. and things that may or may not be appropriate to discuss at work. But what you're clearly finding is that, and I refer you back, I suppose, to the stress vulnerability model, um, and, and being person-centred, that this chap is clearly distressed about his relationship and he wants to talk about it. And the risk is if you just bat it back, you end up with that person becoming stressed more stress than then going off sick. So whether it's worth spending some time now, getting to know him, um, having a brief conversation, <coughs> then maybe directing him to, who knows, whether it's your employee assistance program or relate even. Um, but the fundamental thing is it's, it's coming up at work. So again, it just needs to be dealt with and you need, you need to have that kind of conversation. Okay, um, so we're coming to our final question. Um, and Kath asks, uh, what do I do if someone is underperforming and they have a mental health problem, I'm worried about doing the wrong thing. Emma, this is a very common question, mm. isn't it? People want, understand, they want to help, but how, how, do, you, how do you get into that conversation? Um, I think if someone is, is underperforming and it's related to a mental health problem, I think it's then looking at how does that mental health problem impact on their ability to do their work? What can you put in place to kind of offset that or mitigate? and then reviewing whether that's working or not. Um, I suppose if it gets to a point where support measures and reasonable adjustments, if they're covered by the Equality Act and you put all these things in place and the person still is struggling, I suppose then maybe you might look at a medical capability route. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to explore all things and I think the employer needs to feel confident that they've done as much as they can before taking any other different routes. Um, that's what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Where does occupational health feature in all this, Ben? Well, I mean, I think it, it, it's crucial. Um, 
And as, as I said before, I think you know early intervention is is, is really really important. So I mean, mm. ho hopefully, you know, by doing that, you can prevent some issues from from escalating to the point where they they do you know become a performance issue. But I think Emma's right that um, you know you 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 have to, as an employer, I think. Um, be able to, you know, sort of feel like you can look look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know, we've done what we can mm -hmm. to support this individual. Um, um, apply common sense, um, and um, but also, you know, recognise that, that that you know you are as a you know as an employee you're running a business or you know you have certain um, certain you know objectives that you, you 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 know you can't go beyond. So it's just trying to find the, the right balance, I mm -hmm. think, um, and that would. You know, depend on the size of organisation, how much how much resources you have. Um, but I think, as an employer, if, if you if you feel that you you put in place uh, as much support as possible, then um, you know any uh, decision that ultimately you might have to make, then at, at least you've you know, you have acted like a reasonable employer. Yeah, yeah. Julian, uh, for me, I think it's fundamentally down to thinking around reasonable adjustments maybe. Um, and I think here sometimes you need to think as much around loyalty and think around ethical decisions as an employer as much around cost. For example, I've worked with somebody who almost never dismisses anybody. After you've been there a few years and you've committed to them, they'll support you through almost everything. Now I suppose that's easy if you're in a high profit sector, maybe more easy than others. But do have a think about that. It's not always about the money. It's about, you know, do you owe this person after 25 years? You know, think about what you can do to bend it a bit while maybe you put in support through occupational health or other measures. Um, other things, so uh, look around maybe reducing targets. So can you temporarily expect them to achieve less if they're in a particularly acute phase maybe of an illness? Look at role carving, so focus on what can they do, what are they doing well, is it possible, I think Emma you mentioned something like this earlier, so get them doing what they can do well and for a period of time maybe other colleagues can take on the what they can't do and maybe achieve a fair share through it. Also think about including people's advocates, if somebody has got a long standing mental health problem then they might have an advocate and they could come in, look at are they in a trade union, is there some support they could get through there. Um, and the other thing we haven't mentioned yet is access to work yeah, actually as well good. and there's a massive massive drive on uh, I think the statistic is 4% at the moment of access to work mm. something like that is access to work budget spent on mental health um, yeah, could you just explain what access to work is because not everybody knows uh, okay so access to work is a government scheme available through job center plus and it kicks in where reasonable adjustments may be deemed to be at an end. So they offer fantastic opportunities. So if somebody is maybe not able to drive, they will pay for taxis uh, to and from work. Uh, in domiciliary care agencies, for example, um, they have been known to pay for taxis between visits. Mm -hmm. So it's about supporting uh, people to stay in work and I think the other statistic you might know this better than me I think for every pound the Treasury spends it actually gets one pound 28 pence or thereabouts back in terms of not paying benefits increased tax and national insurance mm. revenue um, so yeah the glories of Google access to work yeah <laughs> access to work is excellent so we're um, we're coming towards the the end of this um, webinar I'm just going to put my panelists on notice uh, to ask them one final question which will be um, if there was one thing that you would advise an HR professional to do to really make a change to the mental health uh, environment in their organisation, what would it be? But before, uh, while they consider that, collect their thoughts, um, just to signpost uh, you to a number of uh, support resources that are available um, online on the MIND website. Uh, you can sign up for our e-newsletter, which gives you access to a whole variety of uh, resources um, as, they're, as they're published and we already have a number of free guides for employers um, around a number of different issues um, in, the, in the, the, uh, the mental health environment including introductions to mentally healthy workplaces, how to take stock of mental health in your workplace and how to promote well-being um, in, your, in your workplace. In addition to that there's a whole variety of uh, forms of additional support that uh, we at MIND are very happy to offer through our training consultancy arm, our 150 local minds, 
um, and our info line and advice services. So please, if you do have any questions, uh, please do, do feed them in or indeed go to our website to find out more about the support that we're able to offer. Um, so, um, panel, uh, the one thing, Ben? Um, I suppose for me it would be uh, reviewing the effectiveness of management development programmes to ensure that they are equipping line managers with those sort of hearts and mind skills. Great. Emma? Um, <laughs> carry out a review of all your policies that relate to people management and see how much mental health is kind of foregrounded, if it's taken account of, and also, you know, looking to implement a, and develop and implement a mental health strategy. Uh, for me, I suppose it's uh, around spending a day with people who've got mental health issues. So maybe taking a day out from work, go to a mind day centre, go to any day centre, just do something so you're immersing yourself in all the challenges that people may face. And when you go back, you'll be much more comfortable dealing with people who raise issues. And I think you'll be able to just get in their shoes just a little bit more. Thank you very much to, uh, to Julian, to Emma and to Ben. Um, thank you for all of you who have watched this webinar. Um, there are, there's plenty of uh, further information available and if there's anything you'd like to follow up on, then please do contact us uh, on the details that are shown on the screen at the moment. Um, I'm going to ask all our panels what the 10 things they do outside work is uh, over the, <laughs> once this is finished. Um, um, as I can also remind you that as it is a Friday, please do go and have a good lunch break um, and enjoy your weekend. Thanks very much indeed. Goodbye.